So good to see y'all. I was just complaining a little bit. Sorry, because we're still in lockdown over here. And I just realized that not only have we been in lockdown for over a year, I've actually been doing these. We've been doing our virtual visits for almost almost a year now. We're, we're just shy of a year. So um, that's the positive side of all this. So it's very good to see y'all. And thank, thanks to everybody for being faithful viewers. I love our group. I think we're, um, it seems as, as people get vaccinated and uh, the weather starts to get nicer, not everybody um, makes it all the time. So, um, but our faithful group is all together. So that's it's very nice to see everybody. And big thank you also to everybody who has been donating right along and who's already made donations for this episode. We literally would not be here without y'all's generosity um, because your donations cover all of our um, production costs. So we're very grateful. Lorenzo and I both are grateful to y'all for being here and for showing up and for your smiling faces and for your donations. Thank you so much. Um, so today we are gonna go um, to Florence and we're gonna talk about a painting by the artist called Botticelli. And I'm just showing you a, sort of um, the inset map there is downtown Florence, historic center of Florence. And you can see here the Duomo, you know, it's cut by the Arno River, the Duomo, here's um, uh, Piazza della Repubblica, here's Piazza Signorio with Palazzo Vecchio, here's Santa Maria Novella, the great Dominican um, complex. And the little pink dots are kind of some places that we're going to talk about. So this pink dot here is in a street that today is called Via del Porcellana, but it used to be called Via Nuova, the new street. And that is where um, the artist, which who we call Botticelli, was born in 1444. And the work of art that we're going to talk about um, was originally hung in the Medici Palace, which we now call the Palazzo Medici Riccardi, which is here on Via Cavour. Uh, which used to be called Via Larga, which was the wide road. And you can kind of see it, look, it's the wide road. So when you're in down in downtown Florence, all these tiny little alleyways, here's the wide road, Via Larga. Now Via Cavour. And he is now in the collection of the Galleria degli Uffizi, the great Uffizi Museum, which is this nice, big, humongous U-shaped building here, which was the offices. Uffizi is uh, the Italian for offices, or the Tuscan anyway, for offices. And, um, I would like to thank the Galleria degli Uffizi for giving me the rights to reproduce images of works of art that are uh, today in their collection. And so the work of art that we're going to concentrate on is in their collection, as are a bunch of the kind of supporting works. So we'll see those in a second. So on the map, of course, here's Florence, and this is where I'm located, just here southwest of Florence at the Castle of Popiano. And we're bursting out with spring. My lady banks here, Rose, is trying to take over but it's very beautiful. We have had a cold snap, but um, spring is uh, spring has sprung, so that's good. So we're gonna talk about this artist, Alessandro uh, Botticelli. He was born Alessandro Filippetti. And again, he was born in Florence in 1444, 1445. And he lived and worked in Florence all his life. And he lived and worked on that street all of all his life. Um, he made very few trips out, um, one big one, which we'll talk about. And the painting you're looking at here is kind of his first big commission, his first major commission, which he received as a young artist. And he included his self-portrait. And you can see that um, he's looking out at us here and he's wearing that kind of ochre colored robe. It's, it's quite a beautiful painting, quite a beautiful self-portrait. And I've always just sort of been enamored of him. He has this kind of big eyes and just kind of full lips. He looks like a, kind of a pretty um, Florentine painter. Um, so as a boy, interestingly, he was born into a family, I think his father worked with leather, which was sort of a common craft, craftsman, um, kind of crafts job in Florence. His brothers did various things. One worked in, you know, kind of did some real estate. One was a battiloro, which is a goldsmith. He beat metal, beat gold, battiloro. Um, and Sandro, so Alessandro short, is shortened to Sandro, was apprenticed to a goldsmith. And he eventually decided he wanted to be a painter. So he entered his, entered his first um, painting apprenticeship at age 19, which is really kind of late. Most times um, painters get started around age 10, literally. So he entered the painting, a painting workshop at around um, age 19. So his last name then, Botticelli, we're really not sure. We call him Botticelli. It comes from one of his brother's professions and it's kind of a mystery. There's a lot of mystery going on with uh, Botticelli. He's kind of an enigmatic artist and some of his paintings are enigmatic just because of the time period. Um, so this is his first kind of big commission. But before we talk about that, I'm gonna show you um, some of the artists that he studied with. So age 19, he entered 
the um, uh, studio of Fra Filippo di Fi. So around 1465, you're looking at this nativity there on the left. And from Fra Filippo di Fi, um, Sandro Botticelli learns the basic techniques of painting. He learns how to construct perspectives. This is 14, uh, 1465 here. So they've kind of figured that out. And um, remember, new thing about 50 years prior, they were literally figuring out the mathematical concepts of how to plot perspective. So now they know how to do that. Fra Filippo Lippi teaches uh, Botticelli how to do that. Um, he learned how to kind of create volumetric figures, how to make figures have weight and seem like they're actually, you know, have weight on the ground. And he learned sort of this um, fascination for very fine, fine details, kind of almost miniature-like particulars. And you can see there's almost like a little still life right here. And you can't really make it out because it's minute. Um, but that comes from, that kind of idea comes from Flemish paintings, which were in fact in Florence and which these painters saw, and lots of these painters were heavily influenced by Netherlandish painting. This is an altarpiece called the Portinari altarpiece. It was painted by Hugo van der Goes, a Netherlandish painter, but it was commissioned by a guy called Tommaso Portinari, who was a Florentine who worked in Bruges, and he was a representative of the Medici Bank of Florence. We're gonna talk a little bit about the Medici and their banks. Um, so they had this banking empire, literally, and one of their, representatives in Bruges brought this painting back to Florence. So this is one of these Flemish paintings that was extremely influential. Um, the kind of thing that Botticelli got out of this, again, is um, the fine attention to detail and even this kind of idea of almost including sort of a still life, almost like a botanical representation of, um, in this case, um, the flowers that are in this little uh, lusterware pot. From the studio of Fra Filippo Lippi, Botticelli moved into the studio of Verrocchio. So you see him in the middle here. There's a Madonna and Child painted in 14, painted in 1470. Uh, Fra Filippo Lippi and Verrocchio were the two kind of major studios in Florence at the time. And so he went through both, of, kind of cycled through both of those. Leonardo da Vinci, interestingly, was in the studio of Verrocchio as well. And they were about the same age, but kind of interesting, just the way things played out. Um, Botticelli was kind of the last great artist of the 1400s, and Leonardo went on to be the, kind of the first great artist of the 1500s. So this, this is all taking us through up to the end of the 1400s and then into the beginning of the 1500s. So Verrocchio, so you see here the Madonna and, and Christ in the, in the center, who also, there was also sculpture coming out of this workshop, by the way, but as far as paintings goes, um, there's this great attention to naturalism, an interesting way of placing figures in space. You can kind of see the monumentality that's given here, that kind of pushing the figures up to the front of the picture plane. That does not happen here with Lipo Lipi. They're kind of back there a little bit. Um, they're very much removed from us. But interestingly, the figures with uh, in this particular painting by Verrocchio are pushed up real close kind of into our space. And then another interesting thing is how Verrocchio basically defines the volumes of the bodies underneath the draperies by kind of modeling the draperies, how he uses draperies. And just keep drapery in mind when you see Botticelli's works because um, it kind of has an interesting, um, he uses it to interesting effect. And then lastly, and I don't know if he was actually in the workshop of Paolo Brothers, Antonio del Paolo and Piero, but he certainly uh, knew their work and was heavily influenced by them. And what you see here on the right is Hercules and the Hydra, 1475, in the collection of the Uffizi. And what, um, Botticelli really got from the Polaiolo brothers is the idea of line. Verrocchio has some of that, but even more so in the Polaiolo brothers, the way he literally has a contour outline of the figures and the way he even uses line to um, create movement and define action. He gets this idea of action by the way he uses his line. So kind of remember those things um, when you're looking at uh, Botticelli, line, um, drapery, movement, that kind of thing. So back to this commission. Um, his first big commission was given to him in 1469. I think the painting was installed in 1475 in a family, um, five private family chapel in Santa Maria Novella, which you see there on the left, great facade designed by the great Leon Battista Alberti. This is a really kind of great Renaissance composition. Um, it's a square, there's a triangle that's in the square. There's this circle that comes out this way and kind of swoops us into it. Um, the nativity scene is set in these sort of crumbling Roman ruins. Interestingly, there's this kind of frontal image of the Holy Family, 
And what we're looking at here is not just the nativity scene, but it's the Magi who have come to pay homage to the Christ child. So we have this nice, tight Renaissance composition. It was commissioned from Botticelli by a guy called Gaspare de Lami, a barber's son from Empoli, which is just up the street from me. Um, he made it big as a money changer, which you know doesn't always have great connotations. So he goes into banking, basically, and he's living in, in Florence. And he's depicted himself not in the place of honor, touching the feet of the Christ child, for heaven's sakes. No, he's, he's placed himself here. So this is the guy who commissioned the whole painting. He made it, he basically made his fortune. He, you know, by buying, he kind of bought, he kind of, he's sponsoring this private altar. I don't know even how to, you know, it's almost like he got this, he bought the skybox at the big stadium or something. I mean, he, this is kind of a big, kind of big expense. And it was a highly visible commission. You know, everybody saw this. So he did this, you know, not just kind of for devotional purposes, but he also did, he did it for other reasons. And one of which is a little bit of brown nosing, because what he decided to do here is he asked the artist to depict members of the Medici family as the Magi and the contingent around them. So Cosimo um, Il Vecchio, who's seen here, I'll show you, here he is. Here's Cosimo Il Vecchio. He is kind of the founder of this dynasty of this banking family in Florence. They became very wealthy. They became de facto rulers. They were kind of the seniority of Florence. Um, de facto rulers and then, in fact, rulers. And in fact, they ended up being, um, their, uh, their family line uh, continued on to be actual, you know, the first Duke of Tuscany and then Grand Duke of Tuscany later in the 16th century. So here we are in about 1470. And here's Cosimo Il Vecchio, um, who has passed away. and. He has passed power on to his son, Piero. Here's his other son, Giovanni. Piero reigns for only five years and um, the person who takes over is his son, Lorenzo. And I've seen different interpretations of this. Some scholars believe this is Lorenzo. This looks a heck of a lot like Lorenzo to me. I kind of like that. Lorenzo il Magnifico, Lorenzo the Magnificent, who presides over literally the golden age of Florence. So these guys are all pictured here and one would, presume that Gaspare de Lami, who um, commissioned this painting, ran this by the Medici before he did this. Like I said, highly visible um, commission here on a family altar in the great Dominican church of Santa Maria Novella in the center of Florence. So surely the, the Medici were aware of this. They must have approved it. They would have seen drawings probably by the artist Botticelli. They seem to have actually known Botticelli. And then Interestingly, on the left side here, the, the people who were shown are uh, Giuliano de' Medici, brother of Lorenzo, with the poet Poliziano or Politian, who is literally kind of draped over uh, Giuliano. Giuliano is sort of proud and standing tall, and then there's this lovely Politian who's literally draped over his shoulder. And then next to him is the philosopher Pico della Mirandola, who seems to be saying, what are you doing? You know, pay attention, is what it looks like he's saying. So this is Giuliano Poliziano, the poet, and then this philosopher, Pico della Mirandola. So um, Giuliano and his father, or excuse me, grandfather, um, Cosimo had kind of sponsored this academy of Neoplatonist thought. And it was, um, there were philosophers there. There were also uh, poets, writers, and artists. And Botticelli seems to have been a member of this. In fact, he, he in fact depicts himself in the picture here with all these guys. So, um, he, and it wasn't, he, he's literally up front. Here he is. You know, he, he, it's not his little face is buried in the back. He, you, can, you can see more of him than you can of the guy who sponsored the, um, the painting. So Botticelli really, you know, seems to, he's a young guy here, first big commission, but he feels comfortable enough putting himself in here with the Medici. So he was, and then one more portrait, this guy is looking out at us. This seems to be a guy called Lorenzo di Pier Francesco de Medici. So he is sort of a cousin to Lorenzo il Magnifico, a separate line of the family, but definitely right in there with them. And it's this line of the family actually that then becomes the Dukes of Tuscany. So keep him in mind because he's gonna be important in a moment. So right after this commission happens, um, this painting is placed on the altar in 1475 in Santa Maria Novella. Shortly thereafter is the Pazzi conspiracy. So the Pazzi family, backed up by the Pope, Sixtus IV, decides for political reasons, they're gonna get rid of the Medici. They, they're done with this. They don't want the Medici ha having all this power in their hands. And they organize a conspiracy in which they're gonna kill Giuliano and Lorenzo. And this happens in church, in the Duomo. Um, Giuliano, this is 1478, by the way. Giuliano was killed, Lorenzo was injured, but managed to escape. 
Um, but what he did, of course, was um, punish his enemies mercilessly, and had, he had their effigies, those cadavers, painted on the outside of the town hall, Palazzo Vecchio, which of course is still the town hall today. And the person who he hired to paint the effigies of the cadavers of his enemies was Botticelli. So clearly, Lorenzo il Magnifico had great trust in Botticelli, and Botticelli was in this group. Those effigies were right here above this door called the Porta della Dogana. Of course, they no longer exist. They were actually pulled down for political reasons before they were ruined by the elements, but they most likely wouldn't have been here in any event. Um, so Botticelli was kind of a, a free uh, agent. He was definitely close in and trusted by the Medici, but he also worked for the Vespucci family. Here's just one example of a fresco that was done in the Church of the Ondi Santi, which was the kind of home church of the Vespucci family, as in Amerigo. Um, he came later, but this is, um, this is 1480. And I'm showing you this because I think it's absolutely gorgeous. I actually popped in here the other day because I get my hair cut down the street and I was going back to my car and I saw, I'll just pop into this church. I'd kind of forgotten. It is just full of amazing works of art. And this is one of them. And this is St. Augustine in his study. And what's great here is that you can see uh, Botticelli's wonderful painting technique, the monumentality of the figure, the great attention to detail with all those objects in the study of St. Augustine. And then what's really great here, which shows you that when he, needs to do so, Botticelli certainly can represent this expression of the saint's emotional state of mind. So the painting we're going to look at is a little bit, has a little bit more kind of uh, composure and reserve, but I really just wanted you to see what Botticelli is capable of when he wants to really kind of show you, um, you know, express, have these, have his figures express their emotions. He's certainly very capable of that. So that was one of the things about Botticelli that made him one of the most well-known and successful painters of the late 1400s. He was called to Rome, in fact, to help decorate the Sistine Chapel in 1481. And here you can see the Sistine Chapel interior there on the left. Um, all the greatest artists of the day were called in here beginning in the um, mid to late 1400s. So when um, Botticelli was there, the important workshops um, became one of the most important uh, painting workshops in Florence. Perugino and Pinturicchio were there, Signorelli was there, and they were doing these kind of Old Testament historical scenes that run along this, this panel here. And you can kind of see what uh, Botticelli did there. And another thing he's really good at is um, narrative clarity. These are various stories in um, the life of Moses. And there's a lot going on here, but he's really used composition, landscape, kind of this oblique landscape, trees, architecture, to kind of separate out all the various scenes. So he's very good at narrative clarity. He's also, again, just that attention to detail. Look at the women. These are the women at the well, who you can see there at the top. Lovely hairdos. Um, these are sort of country women with their shawls on. One of them's got a little clutch of either sort of or apples or something. I'm not sure what the fruit is, but um, it's really kind of charming and um, just attention to, you know, minute attention to detail. So this is 1481. Um, when, so this is the trip to Rome. Botticelli comes back to Florence and at the height of his mature style, he paints these mythological paintings. He kind of invented this really. And this, this particular painting is called Primavera or Spring. And it's kind of become an icon of modern culture and it reflects the taste of Florence at the time, particularly the, the taste of the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent. And we don't actually know a ton about this painting. Um, we believe it was painted upon Botticelli's return from Rome. So let's just around 1482, it looks like that. Um, and we know Botticelli painted it. It's huge, it's six and a half feet by 10 feet. It's in the Uffizi today. Um, it's on poplar panel. And he painted it with um, tempera grassa, which is a uh, pigment mixed with egg yolk and then animal glue. And we're not totally sure who he painted it for. Uh, we don't, or we don't have any documents. We actually, I think we know who he's for, but we have no documents that say exactly who commissioned this painting. But we do have doc. We have three inventories from the years 1498, 1503, 1516, and it was hanging in the Pazzo Medici in Via Larga. So here's the building that was originally built by Cosimo Il Vecchio, who you can see here. This is a painting by the marriage artist Pontormo, which is all the laurel branches behind Cosimo the Vecchio, Cosimo Il Vecchio. Laurel was one of the heraldic symbols of the Medici family, and we'll look at that more closely. So this today is on kind of a busy tourist street, really, and it's Palazzo Medici Ricardi. 
and the interior looks like this. Here's the kind of entry courtyard, and there's um, one of the um, reception halls. And this is where the Primavera, or uh, springtime, was hanging. And it was actually hanging in a chamber next to the bedroom of Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, the guy we saw back in the Magi painting. Um, he um, married in uh, the year uh, 1482, a member of the Vespucci family called Simiramide Appiani, and they married in the spring of 1482. So we believe this was painting was commissioned for that event. Um, we've lost track of it until about the 1550s, at which point um, it's documented in the Villa del Castello, which was um, kind of a countryside retreat for Cosimo I, for the Dukes of Tuscany, from that same branch of the family of Lorenzo di Pier Francesco. So it would have, could have easily passed, uh, passed down through the generations to end up here in the Villa di Castello. This is um, one of the Medici villas that has UNESCO World Heritage status. This happens to be about 15 minutes away from the airport, if y'all have ever flown into Florence. And it's known as this great um, kind of countryside retreat Crete with um, beautiful architecture that really works with the landscape architecture and these great Italian formal gardens. This is one of the first examples of that. So it's very well known for that. And in the 1550s, Primavera was hanging here together with the so-called Birth of Venus, which is another one of those um, really super famous paintings by Botticelli, which has kind of entered um, just sort of pop culture because of the you know, massive reproduction of every possible element of this painting. This is not actually the birth of Venus. This is Venus being blown ashore by Zephyr, the god of the northwest wind, and Aura. She is the goddess who brings in spring. And so Venus is being blown ashore on Cyprus, which is the location of her sacred garden. And so that's what's happening here. Venus is about to um, be, you know, one of her nymphs here is going to wrap her lovely silk cloth around her and they're going to go to the sacred garden. Well, it turns out, here's the Primavera. And what we're looking at is this, um, an allegory of a different Venus. She's known as Venus Humanitas. And here we are seemingly in her sacred garden. And we have, so Venus is sort of holding court with these, uh, grou a group of mythological figures on a flowering lawn in a kind of an orange grove, a space in an orange grove, a, you know, a, what do you call that? A clearing in the wood, basically. And there's myrtle, it's all oranges in the background, laurel over here, and then there's myrtle branches kind of spraying out behind this great figure of Venus Humanitas. So remember, this was created during the golden age of Florence, uh, most likely um, uh, commissioned by a Medici. Lorenzo il Magnifico had established peace. The Medici were great patrons of the arts and they had created this Academy of Neoplatonic Study. Um, so there's this, uh, we've talked about this before. Um, this is one of the first examples of this though, this is where the poets and philosophers and artists and the commissioner are all kind of talking about how to, how to go about, how to create a composition. So in this instance, um, there is literally contact between this um, Neoplatonic Academy, which was led by a figure called Marsilio Ficino, here he is, and um, other participants were Politian, the poet, Pico della Mirandola, and of course Sandro Botticelli was there to kind of interpret everything. So what they're, they're doing here, I'm going to make this really brief. So their idea is this reinterpretation of Plato um, with the tenet that man should let himself be guided by reason, to be open to contemplation of the divine. Okay, this is getting really complicated and this painting gets really complicated. And Botticelli had to interpret all this, okay? So not only though, were they studying um, the philosophy of Plato, they were also studying symbols, mysticism, astrology. Ficino was even an astrologer. So they were dealing with all sorts of stuff. Ficino or, and some of these guys were actually being paid to translate Plato from the Greek. They were trying to make all of this kind of knowledge available. So one, there's one uh, ancient text here. There's a, um, a line from Ovid's Fasti that literally talks about Venus who extends her hand over the month of April. And that of course is when spring begins. And Venus of course is the goddess of love and fertility. So that's kind of a starting point here. Then there's this philosopher Ficino who literally has a doctrine of love. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then there's this great letter that he wrote to Pier Francesco, the Lorenzo di Pier Francesco, and he had looked at his star chart, right? So he, now he's doing astrology on the side. And so he 
is telling, we have this letter that, uh, that Ficino here, painted by Pier del Francesco, by the way, um, wrote to Lorenzo di Pier Francesco and said he urged him to let his actions be inspired by his star chart and to favor the influence of the planets Venus and Mercury. So all this is helping us figure out what's going on in this painting because it's a little bit enigmatic. So here we go. We have Venus and Mercury though, so that's a start. <clears throat> so I'm just going to sort of tell you what's happening here and we're going to start from the right. And so we have this metamorphosis of Chloris. This is Chloris. She's a wood nymph and she's got flowers literally coming out of her mouth. She generates flowers. She, thanks to her union with Zephyr, there's Zephyr again, the chilly northwest wind who's kind of blowing onto uh, Chloris. Chloris literally metamorphosizes. She turns into, she transforms into Flora. And here's Flora. You can see that a little bit closer up. So Flora is literally the uh, transformed Chloris. And Flora is the personification of spring. And see, she's loaded with garlands of flowers. She's on this elegant dress, which is covered with flowers. This is contemporary dress, by the way. So we're talking about mythological figures, but they're dressed in contemporary clothing. And you can actually see, in fact, one of the inventories actually went so far as to say, and this figure has, you know, the great uh, flower dress on and the finestrelle, little windows where her lovely puffy little silk um, undergarment pops out. That was the style. Style of day. And it's quite delicate and lovely. And they have these little ties so that um, they kind of tie the sleeve on so that your lovely undergarment can kind of pop out. So here's a close up then of the wonderful Chloris, who's literally generating flowers out of her mouth. Flora, lovely allegory of spring, symbol of nature, you, but nature with the capital N, right? So we're talking about the cyclical force of nature, regenerative power. Think about spring, rebirth, all of that. In the very center of the painting is the Venus Humanitas. So for the Neoplatonists who were, you know, up there talking to Botticelli and figuring out how to, what they were going to represent here for the painting of um, Lorenzo and Semiramide, this is the allegory of universal love. So this is love, um, not as the carnal sentiment, but as a sentiment leading to contemplation. So this is going to help us transcend our earthly experience and kind of go into the next realm of intellectual thought. So this is some sort of that doctrine of love by Ficino. So they're also, by the way, trying to reconcile here at the Platonic Academy, Neo-Platonic Academy, they're trying to rec reconcile myth and church. So the church at this point was, of course, Catholicism. And so notice how Venus is represented. She's wearing the camicia da Giordano, which um, would be very common for a woman at this period. But she's wearing this kind of matronly mantle, which is just like the Madonna, what the Madonna wears, and she's framed um, with these myrtle branches, and she actually looks a lot like uh, a Christian Madonna, and we'll talk about the symbolism of the myrtle in a minute. And then on the left side of the painting is Mercury, who has this little stick, and he's kind of stirring up the clouds, and here we get into some really kind of convoluted Neoplatonic theory. Um, Basically, I'm going to go with their kind of nostalgic worldview. And the idea is that while they're living the moment, they're already feeling nostalgia for it because they know that it's going to inevitably it's going to come to an end. So the idea here is that Mercury is actually trying to stir up the clouds to make sure that it doesn't really, literally rain on the parade here. He's trying to kind of keep the bad weather at bay and ma maintain spring. But, you know, think about this in... Um, kind of societal and political, um, the overtones that it has here for the golden age of Florence. Um, so that's Mercury. And then we have these lovely three dancing girls. Again, a bit of a mystery. The three graces, absolutely gorgeous figures um, depicted by Botticelli with just these perfectly sheer little veils on. They have been interpreted as anything from the three various forms of love, to maybe some planets, to perhaps just the Hesperides, who are the nymphs of the golden sunlight. They're the nymphs of sunset, and they populate the um, garden, the secret, sacred garden of Venus on Cyprus. So I kind of like that interpretation of them. And look at them up close. Look at the detail that Botticelli has kind of lavished upon them. First of all, they're just beauties. And they're actually, they actually believe this uh, may be one of the, this is may, perhaps Simonetta Vespucci, who was known as one of the most beautiful women in Florence. 
um, and sort of his muse. And you can see how he's given so much attention to the detail of their lovely, um, you know, sheer uh, and gold drapes, their amazing hairdos, the jewels that they're wearing, and their lovely the interaction of their hands as they're um, sort of dancing around. So let's go look at some of the significance of some of the vegetation that's in here because every single thing in this painting has I mean, as you can see we don't actually know what all of it is we're, we're sort of after the fact trying to figure out what's going on here um, and it's a little bit complicated and there's various ways of looking at this painting um, and analyzing the vegetation is one of them so in the background i just went ahead and put in some actual photos here because you can see them a little bit better um, there are bay leaves, which uh, we've seen as used as an emblem, a hera heraldic emblem of the Medici. They symbolize victory and wisdom. Oranges are actually a symbol of matrimony. So think about this as a wedding gift to um, Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco. And they also are a heraldic, heraldic device of the Medici. And then there's myrtle um, in the background of Venus Humanitas, which symbolizes innocence and purity. And I added that picture with the um, the myrtle berries, which is are used on Sardinia to make kind of a liqueur called Mirto, which is kind of a very well known um, kind of uh, bitter after dinner drink, I think. Um, and then here are the flowers and um, sort of the vegetation on the lawn, and then what's coming out of literally the mouth of the forest and um, the skirts of flora. So these are literal botanical studies. Um, there are 70 different kinds of grasses represented. There are 138 kinds of flowers. These are flowers that bloom in spring and they're native to Tuscany. Many of them are symbols of matrimony, love, purity, fertility. There's some more down here. They've included also uh, the iris, or which is called the Giglio, which is a symbol of Florence. You still see that all over, all over the place, even though you know, the soccer team of Florence has the Giglio. Um, some of these flowers don't kind of pop out from the background so well, especially the blue ones, because the green pigment that uh, Botticelli used, unfortunately, over time, oxidized and darkened. So a lot of the blue flowers, like borage, um, the cornflower, the iris, the violet, it's a little bit hard to make them out with that kind of dark background. So overall, um, we have this gorgeous or kind of ornamental painting. Um, it's a, really a Botticelli was not going for um, hyper-realism here, or even illusionistic recession of faith, any of that. It's this ideal scene that kind of transcends reality. He's literally made it almost like a diorama on a stage set, you know, with this kind of clearing in the wood of the sacred garden of Venus. And he's really relying on contour and line to create movement. Look at Flora, how she kind of rushes through the garden here with her billowing draperies and the lovely dancing three graces. Um, and he kind of creates almost a rhythm here. So it's kind of a, an, almost like a rhythmic kind of ornament is what we're looking at, which again, kind of takes you into, kind of transcends reality and takes you into another world. And at the same time, we're definitely looking at this lovely sort of celebration of spring, but it's not just sort of like the woohoo celebration. There's kind of a composure here, almost a detachment in the figures, particularly in the figure of Venus, or even in the figure of the Graces, who are just sort of, they're not even, interacting with each other. Um, and this really kind of harkens back to the kind of feeling of the writings of Pico della Mirandola and Marsilio Ficino, this sort of melancholy sense of nostalgia for this moment that we know is fleeting, we know it's not going to last. And in fact, we're kind of at the end of the Golden Age of Florence here. Um, the Golden Age of Florence um, kind of succumbs with the death of Lorenzo il Magnifico, there's political strife, um, there is, um, that's the kind of flames of that are fed by um, the kind of reforming um, ideas of the uh, Savonarola, the preacher, this kind of style actually just totally gives way to the high renaissance which comes about um, just a couple of decades after this, so you end up with the classicizing um, compositions of the high renaissance which really kind of gain favor and uh, become kind of popular and you know remain in um, kind of our um, memory for literally centuries after that. But here we are, let's just close with Botticelli's lovely um, ideal scene of the golden age and here in the sacred garden of, uh, of Venus. 
So again, the painting is hanging in the Uffizi. Here's an image of the Uffizi. Um, hopefully it will open one day soon and we'll all be able to go to the museum again. Again, thanks to the Uffizi for permission to use images of the works of art that are not in their collections. And we are gonna go on and make some recipes that, um, a recipe three ways that um, really celebrate spring. And we're using vegetables that are kind of have this ephemeral quality about them. I'm gonna go over to the stove. And um, they all have relatively short seasons. And this is kind of a moment when we can put them all together and combine them. Lorenzo, veríamos the... Sí, la, Elaine, we have two questions. Uh, okay. the, the one I think I, I have answered, the, um, the church very near where you have your hairdresser is Onisanti. Yes. Okay. Onisanti. Is where the Sant Agustin uh, study. Yes. Okay. Yes. And the other things that I want to say is because uh, the, um, you, you show the, um, uh, the Castello Villa uh, of Medici. Sí and uh, it's very near my house and um, oh, good. it's very incredible I interesting because uh, in uh, castello villa there's this the um, the accademia della crusca oh yeah ja. uh, the academia academia della crusca is an organization that uh, uh, is very important a reference for the italian languages oh right okay yes if you have any question about uh, Italian language or Italian words, uh, also for the Italian people, not only for stranger, uh, you can ask to Academia della Crusca. And it's very interesting that is in Florence because we say that <laughs> Italian is born in Florence. So that's, that's Lorenzo's patriotism coming out, but it's true. And the, and the Medici kind of left these villas and this idea of these academies as well. And so currently it's interesting that it, today there's this, um, Academy of the Italian language and I think dialects as well. Don't they also speak about dialects, study dialects at yeah. the Academia della Crusca? Yeah. Um, at Castello. Interesting. Yeah, which is in Sesto near Lorenzo's house and again not far from the airport. So m many of y'all have probably been near, near there. I just threw in the pasta. Um, we're going to make one recipe three ways, one of which is going to be a pasta sauce and the pasta I used is busiaki and um, can you see it's kind of twirling and this is made with a kind of grain called bidi which is a heritage wheat from Sicily. And this is actually from Molino del Ponte. Um, thanks very much to Filippo Drago, who um, sent me some samples. Um, I ordered some flour and I got this great package of stuff that, you know, I got the flour, but I also got other stuff, including these great Bustiati di Bidi. And these are available from Gustiamo, by the way, and I'll put a link when I send you all the recipe. And I also found out today that Bustiati means dough that was rolled around a buso. And this, is a buso. It's just a little stick. So my friend's grandmother used to sit around making bustiati all morning long and she rolled her dough on the bus on the buso and something that's bustiato was rolled around the buso. So here you go, bustiati. So that's the pasta we're going to have. Um, and the sauce that we're going to make, again, just sort of celebrate spring vegetables. And I'm using green garlic, which is just one of my most favorite flavors ever. And it's literally around for about two weeks tops and then you can't get it anymore. Um, but I absolutely love it. And you can use, um, other you can just use regular garlic here if you can't get green garlic but um, i like to use it and you kind of use it like a leek i'm going to just trim it and use it from about here down and just sort of slice it almost into kind of julienne type pieces it's, it's got a garlicky flavor but it's also just super um just very fresh and kind of clean different in a way that's different from dried garlic and it's literally garlic that just hasn't quite come up all the way. You know, this literally, this this part eventually becomes the um, the bulb that is then dried that um, you more commonly find in shops. I'm gonna just put that on to kind of um, with some olive oil to just shrink down a little bit and they'll kind of pop apart and then the olive oil um and i'm using um sangona casamona olive oil which is that lecino mono cultivar which is a little bit lighter and brighter than our the blend or the moraiolo it kind of fits with these springtime recipes so i'm sort of happy to have that for this and then the other elements here 
I'm gonna kind of just break these up a little bit. I just chopped it. I'm just gonna break them up so they're not all in a clump. So the other elements are um, peas, which um, I of course have shucked. Um, peas, fresh spring peas. I have some ready to go. I'm just gonna put them in here. And then fava beans, which we get a lot in spring. And I think y'all can find them too. Um, Tuscans tend to eat them raw, um, usually with um, some kind of fresh pecorino cheese. Um, and they're, let's see, here we go. I'm trying to open this up for y'all. So they're just these nice, cute little um, green beans that the Tuscans tend to eat mostly raw. I actually like them cooked. And they in the South, they eat them a lot cooked. Show, show one of these. Let me uh, get them. Because uh, peas are round and the fava beans is not round. Pea, pea. And then this is a bigger fava bean. I think you can actually see it. So this, this is what the fava bean looks like. Yeah, it's cute. It's kind of almost like a little kidney bean shape. And um, I don't know, Lorenzo, do you like them cooked? Because most Tuscans, like I said, generally I prefer, I prefer don't want to see them cooked. Before I prefer rogue. rogue, yeah. OK, I kind of like them cooked. Um, and that's a real Southern thing. Actually, this recipe that we're making, uh, which is called fritella, um, I had in Sicily, it may be a Sicilian recipe. I think that it is actually. And um, Sicily has lots of uh, kind of truck garden and you can just get all this great luscious spring vegetables. I think you, you, you also find uh, dried fava beans. And they also in the South eat dried fava beans and they tend to eat them a little bit bigger. They, let, they, they leave them on the uh, plant a little bit longer to make them bigger. And when they're big like that, I tend to cook them more. And I am making the exact same thing the soup here. And I'll show you two in a minute. I'll show it to you in a second. It's the exact same thing. I just let it cook for longer. And I used all the big fava beans in there because they were going to be cooked. And I'll, I'll show you a close up of that when we serve it. So I'm just going to get this going. This doesn't go for very long at all. I'm going to add an artichoke. And um, we're kind of at the end of artichoke season, but we still have them. Um, so you can use any or all of these vegetables. You don't have to have all four of them. You can just, you can even just just do this with fava beans or even um, just sort of a mix of whatever you can find. I'm also going to add some asparagus, but I'm going to go ahead and add some artichoke because I have it. And these are all vegetables that are so tender they can all be eaten raw. So um, I'm just going to kind of barely cook them. So I've taken off the outer layer there of the artichoke, the outer layer of um, the hard leaves, and I've just pared it down to the kind of light green, light purple leaves. So this is all edible raw. Um, I've paired off the, all the kind of dark green around the bottom so that it's just the literally the heart is there. And now I'm going to cut it into pieces and I'm checking to see if it has any choke and it has zero choke. So if it had any choke, I would cut that out, any of the kind of shiny purple bits and choke, but luckily there isn't any. So I'm just going to make pieces out of it, kind of small pieces and toss it into our spring mix. If you remember, we uh, when we speak about Rome, we use two different kinds of artichoke. We use uh, the mamme, uh, the, the round one, and the, morel, the morelli. And now Elaine used morelli. Yes, that was a morello. I'm going to add a tiny bit of water just to kind of get the artichokes going. Although, like I said, all of this can be eaten raw, so it's not even really super necessary. But if you let it bubble just a second, it kind of softens up the artichoke heart a little bit. Get rid of the water. And I'm going to use some asparagus. So I actually just, some of these are in my front yard. I get, I'm, we have tons of wild asparagus around here. So these are the asparagus that I get wild. You can buy them. I think it's kind of fun to go pick them. So I do. Um, I found this giant one today. Look at him. It's like the nicest asparagus I've ever found. Sometimes they, sometimes they look like this little wispy ones. 
So I'm just going to use these. And again, you know, with asparagus, you literally just, um, this one hardly counts, it's so fine. You use, you know, you, they break off where they're tender. And these wild ones, you throw, and this, this literally is where it broke. I, I'm throwing this part away, and this is the part I'm using. <laughs> There's not much to it. So you know, good thing it has some really potent flavor. Um, because there's not a lot of meat on the bones here. So again, you can just uh, obviously purchase um, asparagus. If there. there's questions, I'd be happy to take questions since with I'm wild, here with, with wild asparagus, asparagus. With wild asparagus, uh, we can make a very wonderful omelette. Come, come? Con, le, con gli asparagi selvatici. Oh, with the, yes, we can make a very good omelette. In fact, that's one of my favorite springtime foods is wild asparagus and uh, eggs. Okay, almost ready to roll. My pasta is not boiling for some reason. There. So I threw that pasta in early because um, those bustiati with the BD literally take 15 minutes to cook. So I'm also, I just realized I didn't use my, the leg of my artichoke, this is the gambo, the leg of the artichoke. I'm going to go ahead and use it. And you can just, you can kind of see where, not why there's brown stuff in there, there. You can kind of see that light white part in the interior is what I'm going to use. And you can just, it just pairs off super easily. Just kind of almost there. Just kind of the hard part just pops right off. There we go. I'm going to add salt and pepper. And I'm going to let this cook just a teensy bit, and then I'm going to add the last element, which is mint. So the three ways that we are going to serve this today are side dish, pasta sauce, and kind of a soup. There's a whole other version of this, which is... Um, literally eaten like a soup and I just did the exact same thing as this and I added a lot more water and I let it cook down so I used literally used you know the bigger peas that aren't quite as um, tender I used the bigger um, fava beans that are not quite as tender and I literally I just let it cook down for about an hour and I'll show you what it looks like hot And to me, this is just the kind of essence of spring, and I'm going to serve it with a, um, can y'all see that? The light is kind of weird. See, si, così meglio. It's kind of a weird color. I know it's brown, but it's really yummy. And I'm going to serve it with a, um, um, a soft boiled, no, what do you call the eggs when they're woven camicha? Um, not soft boiled, but soft boiled. It will come to me. I can't think of what it, what it does. What poached, is that? I used to mean poached. poached. Poached eggs. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I was trying to say. It's very incredible because the the soup have the color of the autumn, but this this the flavor of the spring. I know it's weird. I know everything kind of just turns brown, like the artichoke. I don't know. It just maybe it's the artichoke juice, and because the, the artichoke oxidizes, and then the <clears throat> Fava beans, when you cook them for a long time, kind of go gray. So it's not the most beautiful thing in the whole world, the soup, but it really tastes good. So I'm going to add, um, I'm going to go ahead and add the mint to this one, and then I'll do the egg. Or I'll do the egg, and then I'll add the mint. So I'm going to do the, um, the poached egg. I think I'm going to need to add some water. I don't want to make a mess of this. I have a feeling I'm going to make a mess of it if I don't add some water. 
What did I do with my water? Here it is. I want that to come back to a boil. And then I think the key with the poached egg is just to use a little tap of vinegar in the water to help the egg stay um, together and not turn into egg drop soup. So while that's coming to a boil, I'm gonna go ahead and prepare, um, get the egg ready and then put some mint in uh, what's gonna be our pasta sauce. A gigantic egg. So also just fresh out of the garden, super fresh flavors to go with the super crispy green spring Bine. vegetables. Si. La pasta è a 13 minuti. Grazie. We can put in the soup a piece of bacon, for example. Oh. <laughs> was that his idea? Was that your idea, Lorenzo? Yeah, why not? <laughs> no pork in this no. recipe. Don't need. All right, so I'm just started in. Pork are not springtime. Pork, pork can be springtime. I'm, I'm keeping this vegetarian. Keeping it vegetarian. Um, all right, I'm going to put that egg in and then. Take the pasta out. Mostralo bene. Okay, so you're gonna. Um, so I'm gonna make. Also, I'm gonna stir the boiling water to get it going, kind of like a funnel. And then I'm gonna tip the egg into the center and pray that it just turns into a nice little blob. Lorenzo, tre minuti per favore. Si, presi. Okay. It, 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 there's okay. some difference about the kind of vinegar or not? Oh, I used a white wine vinegar. Um, I would not use balsamic for sure. And basically you don't taste it. It's just a tiny, tiny little bit. So. Yeah, but, but for the, for, for, uh, to, um, to have a poached egg is the same. I think it's only the acid of the, of it's the water. The acid. Yeah. But I think you would probably, I would use sort of like, um, I would use uh, even apple cider vinegar before I used a balsamic vinegar, which tends to be syrupy. And a lot of balsamic vinegars, unfortunately, actually have kind of like a sugar yeah. syrup added to them, and you don't want that in your egg. Yeah. So I would use an apple cider vinegar or a white wine vinegar. All right, so the soup is going to be a little, I mean, the, excuse me, the pasta is still sort of soup y. This is one of those pastas that you eat with a spoon. And I'm actually going to put some of the pasta cooking water in here. My aunt in Sicily does this for me. And when she knows I'm coming, she, she, goes, to the, she goes to the shepherd is what she does. And she gets some ricotta because the lovely touch here is that you stir some fresh ricotta in with all these fresh vegetables and i'm telling you it is just honestly it's just to die for so the pasta has come out of very salted water and i'm going to stir in um and i've added some pasta water and i'm going to stir in the vegetable mix and then i'm going to run i'm just going to stir in some ricotta and this is just uh, and ricotta is also very kind of spring because um uh, the sheep here we are and you eat this with a spoon and this is just oh my gosh this is just pure spring mm. and the ricotta and the mint are so good together that's that's one okay let's see do a venti do a venti, okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and ladle some of the soup into the bowl, and then we'll get the. Um, I don't know where to put all this, and then we'll recover that egg out of there. So here's this kind of brown soup. I know it doesn't look very pretty, but it really does taste good. Promise. 
and it's kind of the little the broth is really good. I used quite a bit of olive oil, so it's got this very kind of salty, oily, nice broth. Ci siamo, tre minuti. Ora precisi. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna just I'm gonna take the egg out and put it right onto a dishcloth, just to get some of the water off. So it looks perfect. So the white's cooked, the um, yolk I can tell is not, which is perfect. And so then I'm just gonna kind of dump that onto my soup. And another spoon. All right, so look how yummy that is. Okay, I know it's brown, but does that not look so good? And then watch this. Hang on, we have to put a little salt on. It's already got salt in it, but there's an egg. I have to have some more salt on the egg. And black pepper. Okay, just salt. This is very Hemingway. Black pepper on the poached egg is very Hemingway. Ken, Ken Burns would approve. I just I just saw that they're doing a um, documentary. You ready? Oh, it went this way. Yum. Look at that. Yummy. It looks so good. So that's two. And then lastly is just kind of side dish with um, the vegetables, which you can serve um, next to any anything. So just yummy spring vegetable side dish. If y'all have any questions, please feel free to ask. If y'all might even want to open your microphones up. How many yeah. people are we? Is it cool? Si, si. Okay. Elaine, Question? Um, would, yes. Yeah, would you ever use any kind of an onion in with those vegetables, like even a spring onion or scallion or? Um, uh, or you could that? do that. Actually, you could do that. If you can't get the fresh green garlic, you can use some kind of a fresh onion, onion. Kind of a mm -hmm. scallion or even some scallion. of those really fresh. Yeah. You could definitely do that. Yeah. In fact, my aunt in Sicily does that a lot. Okay. That would be good. Thanks. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. If you need an acid for your poached eggs, lemon juice works just fine. Oh, good. I did not know that. Good. Okay. Actually, that would probably be better. Well, not, not usually. When we, in Italy, we, we, we speak about um, uh, vinegar. We, we don't uh, say balsamic vinegar. Balsamic vinegar is, is another thing. It's not uh, uh, Normally we don't, uh, when, when someone, no. someone say vinegar, we don't think at balsamic vinegar. No, but I said that on purpose because in the United States, a lot of people think vinegar and they think balsamic vinegar. So yeah. I, I kind of made a point to say that because yeah, here that's not the case. Most vinegar is not balsamic vinegar. Well, when you find a recipe also in Italian recipe and you find the vinegar is not, uh, is ever balsamic vinegar? No, it's not. Unless it's in a recipe from Amelia and it says, and it says balsamic vinegar. So yum. Any other questions, you guys? Are you going to eat all that stuff yourself? <laughs> I think I'm going to freeze it. or I, it'll, You could actually freeze the soup will freeze. I think that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, I'll take a bite of each one is what I'm going to do. Actually, that pasta is calling my name now that I look mm -hmm. at it. <laughs> take an extra bite for me. <laughs> Maria, Maria Luisa is calling your yeah. name too, I can see. <laughs> Maria Luisa is our actual, our other actual Italian on the line. There's two, Lorenzo and, Mar and Maria Luisa. So if she's oh. nodding, then I know that it looks good. You made me hungry there we go. again. <laughs> So yeah, I'll rest yeah, yeah. of these tomorrow. It was so good to see everybody. Thank y'all. Thanks again Thank for tuning you. in. Look, I, look how I'm, I was complaining at the beginning and now I'm smiling. See, the y'all made my day. So, <laughs> thank y'all all for being here. I needed that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I think it looks so good. I want to run to the store and get some veggies. My garden's yeah, not ready yet. <laughs> Same here. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you so yeah. much. Thanks, y'all. You're welcome. Thank you all for being here. Bye. 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 That's it. Bye. 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 B